does not justify. That doesn't. But spiritual baptism does. And we are grateful for our brother identifying with Christ, joining this local assembly, and uh, making it clear you are a child of God. So thank you, brother. Thank you, God, for your grace to us. All right, beloved, let's turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. We'll be beginning in verse 24. Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. If you have a Bible that's under the seat in front of you, you can find that on page 1003. 1003. Amen. Okay, well, let's stand together. God speaks now. Beginning in verse 24, Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, Syrophoenician, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, Because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Well, I want to set up for you what's been going on in the ministry of Jesus so that you don't miss the significance of what Jesus does with this woman. It's really easy to miss the significance of this passage. I want you to think with me. So hang with me for just a second. Chapter 7, how does it begin? It begins with the scribes and the Pharisees following their traditions and forsaking Jesus. And chapter 7 ends with a Gentile woman forsaking tradition and following Jesus. It begins with the scribes and the Pharisees following tradition and forsaking Jesus Christ. It ends now here with this woman forsaking tradition and following Jesus. Significant. Chapter 7 begins with the Pharisees and their scribes concerned with the outward washing, the cleaning of their hands in copper pots and pitchers. And Jesus tells them, well, inwardly, you're hideous. Inwardly, you are as unclean as anyone demonstrated by the way you forsake the law of God in the place of your traditions. That's how chapter 7 begins. Chapter 7 begins with these men being called hypocrites. You remember this. Jesus tells them, look at the evil that comes out of you. You hate your parents, and you make it look spiritual. You make it sound spiritual. That's what's coming out of you, hatred of parents. Well, where does that evil come from, Jesus asks them. Comes from the heart. Comes from the heart. You think yourself clean, scribes and Pharisees. You think yourself clean, Israel, but you are pretenders with evil hearts. Look look, look at what else comes out of you, Jesus says in verses 21 through 23. If you doubt, if if hating your parents wasn't enough, we'll look at 21 through 23 of chapter 7, right? Evil thoughts come out of you. Fornications come out of you. Thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting. Wickedness comes out of you. Deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within... And come out and defile you. And so to the men, at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus says, you think yourselves clean, but you're only pretending. Your heart is the problem. And what comes out of you reveals that you are at your very core actually the opposite of clean. 
But at the end of chapter 7, we find a very different story. A Gentile woman who is unclean on the outside with a daughter who has a what? Unclean spirit. That, in, that word there is intentional. Everything about this situation on the outside looks what? Unclean. This woman, everything on the outside looking unclean, what comes out of her? We've seen what comes out of the Pharisees. What comes out of her? Great faith. Desperate dependence on Christ. Contrite confession of unworthiness. Unshakable belief that this Jesus can deliver. Do you see what is coming out of the Pharisees and the scribes? Do you see what is coming out of her? What comes out of this woman? Righteousness. She is the one clean. This whole chapter is about what does it mean to be clean. The beginning gives you a negative example. The end provides you with, but here's a positive example. Here is what it looks like to be clean. Here is a woman who has, an, uh, who has a clean heart, while the Pharisees, who think themselves clean, are not. All right? What does it mean to be pure and blameless in the sight of God? What does it mean to be clean? Mark has been begging you to ask that question throughout this chapter, and Jesus answers it for you right now. What does it mean to be clean? Well, it means your heart must be made new. Your heart must be made clean. You must be born again. And then from within you, at your very core, clean things can then become, clean things can then begin to come out. So you cannot scrub yourself clean. You cannot clean yourself up within. Who you are at your very core must be made new. And praise God, Jesus is the one who can cleanse you. That's the good news. That's what this chapter is about. Here's what it means to be clean. To demonstrate what it means to be clean, Mark holds up to you, Jesus holds up to you, look at this woman. Look at what God has done in this woman who was unclean but is now clean. Mark holds up this unworthy Canaanite woman to tell you the answer to the question, what does it mean to be right with God? What does it mean to be pure and blameless in His sight? Well, in this woman, you're given three characteristics of a heart made clean. Three characteristics of a heart made clean. Number one, with this woman has a hopeful hearing. A hopeful hearing. I want you to look again at Mark chapter 7. Look at verses 24 and 25. Jesus got up, he went away from there to the region of Tyre, and when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after, what word? Hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now, as far as we can tell, Jesus has now left Gennesaret. You'll notice at the beginning of the chapter, he's at Gennesaret. As far as we know, he hasn't left there yet, so he leaves Gennesaret, and he goes to the region of Tyre, and if you look on a map, I don't have, a, I don't have one for you, but it's, it's, it's northwest of the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus was, has traveled some distance with his disciples, and Tyre is Gentile country. This is Gentile land. So perhaps, the thought is, perhaps, Mark says, there might get some rest. There'll be a bit of rest for Jesus and his disciples. And yet what happens? Does he achieve that, uh, that vacation? Of course not. What happened the last time Jesus left uh, Israelite land and went to Gentile country? Do you remember what happened last time Jesus left and went into Gentile land? He barely set foot on the land and someone comes up to him with a legion of demons. Remember that? It's Mark chapter 5. The gathering demoniac, the gathering demoniac happened. Mark chapter 5, Jesus steps out of the boat and immediately, the text says, immediately the gathering with the legion of demons comes up to him and falls at his feet. Does that sound familiar in Mark 7? This woman, hearing, comes and immediately came and fell at his feet. Seems like some bookends to me. 
This man cries out, what have you to do with us, Jesus? And Jesus, by the end, delivers that man in Mark chapter 5 from the unclean spirits. Jesus sets him free. And now once again, two chapters later, Jesus enters into Gentile territory to get away, and again, he cannot escape notice. Here comes this Gentile woman who, upon hearing of Jesus, immediately comes to him, and she too falls at his feet. Gentile cleansed in Mark 5, Gentile cleansed at the end of Mark 7, and in between, we're thinking about what does it mean to be clean. It means that God has to do a work in you. He has to. Otherwise, you are corrupt. Now, I don't want you to miss this. This woman hears. This woman hears of Jesus Christ, and she flies to him in hope. She hears of Jesus, probably has heard all that he's been doing in the regions. Perhaps she's heard of the 5,000 being fed. We don't know, but she's heard of Jesus, what he's done, and in great hope, she falls down before him and asks that he would deliver her daughter from a demon. That word hearing is so very intentional and important. What has Jesus just said to the scribes and the Pharisees and even to his own disciples about hearing? I want you to look with me. Look at verse 16 of chapter 7. It's just a few verses before this. What does verse 16 say? If anyone has ears to what? Hear. Let him hear. And now this woman is hearing. Look at the verses prior to that. Look at verse 14. Jesus says to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. Listen. Understand. Hear me, Jesus says. And yet these Jews, they hear, and yet they do not understand. They do not listen. And yet now here is this Gentile woman at the end of the chapter, hearing of Jesus Christ, and she does understand. She does understand. How is that possible? It's supposed to grab your attention. You're supposed to have read this in one sitting and go, oh, nobody's, everyone's hearing, but they're not really hearing. Everyone's listening, but they're not really listening. No one's understanding. All in Israel, even his own disciples, they don't get it. There's a Gentile woman. She hears, and she immediately flies to Jesus. She gets it. How's that possible? It's supposed to grab your attention. Well, think about the purpose of the parables. What was the purpose of the parables? Was the purpose of the parables to give greater, shine greater light for all people? Was it, was it, was it supposed to be this picture where like, oh, it will help people understand the sayings, the, the, uh, the truths that Jesus is communicating? Is that the purpose of the parables? Not according to Jesus. The guy that's telling the parables, the God man who's telling the parables says, that's not the point of the parables. The point of the parables is Judgment. The parables are a form of judgment against those with hard and evil hearts who do not want the truth. You're going to get the truth in parables, and you're going to forsake it because you don't get it. But for those in the kingdom, you will get it. I'll even explain it to you, Jesus says. For those outside the kingdom, they will physically hear the parables, and yet they will not spiritually be able to hear and understand them because they're under judgment. If you have forgotten that already, go to Mark chapter 4 later on today. Reread that section. We've read it twice now. It's very clear. That's the purpose of the parables. Judgment. The people of Israel, the scribes, the Pharisees, they, they hear of Jesus Christ. They hear him directly. They hear his teachings. They, they hear him face to face, and yet they do not understand. Why? Because they do not want from within to understand. And how do you know they don't want to from within to understand? What's coming out of them? At a heart level, you can see they are unclean. They are under judgment. They hear, and yet they reject the truth because of their unclean hearts within. But this woman, this Gentile woman, 
A woman, on, a woman unclean on the outside who is considered to be someone without hope and without God in the world. She hears about Christ. She understands. She hears and far from rejecting, what does she do? She runs towards him in great hope. She runs towards Jesus in great hope. Hers is not a forsaking hearing like the scribes and the Pharisees. Hers is a hopeful hearing. Here is a woman who is not under the judgment, but who has been saved from the judgment. She hears of Jesus Christ, and immediately she comes to him. She desperately desires Jesus. She needs him. She's the exact opposite of the scribes and the Pharisees. There is supposed to be a great contrast that you are to understand in this passage. Here are the scribes and the Pharisees, unclean, and then here's this Gentile woman, clean. They hear but don't understand. She hears once and she runs to Jesus. That's big time. This Gentile woman is the exact opposite of all the leaders of Israel. Again, how is it possible? How is it possible that this Gentile woman could be understanding and hearing when all of the Israelites, so many of them, are not? Well, it's only possible if God in His sovereign grace makes it possible by doing a work to change your hearts. If you've been in Sunday school, that should make a lot of sense. God has given Israel, represented by the scribes and the Pharisees here, He's given Israel over to judgment. He's increasingly, you see this increasingly. By the end of Mark, you see the, the fig tree being withered, and that's more on that to come. But that's coming. He's given Israel over to judgment. He's given Israel over to judgment. He's bringing in Gentiles. He's grafting them into the rich olive root. And so these Jewish leaders are given over to their own evil hearts, and yet this Gentile woman is given a new heart. You following me? What does it mean to be clean? So we're trying to answer that question. Obviously from the text, what it means is God must rescue you from the judgment and give you a new heart so that you can hear and believe. Has he done this to this woman? Yes, he has. You cannot hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You cannot hear the good news that Jesus Christ can deliver you from your sin and your impurity. You cannot hear it and obey the call to repent and trust in Jesus. You cannot place your faith in Christ if God has not first rescued you by making you new. So that word in the text, hearing, in verse 25 is massive. It's not an accident. You cannot hear. You cannot receive the good news of Christ crucified for sinners unless God has made you born again. This woman is unlike the scribes and the Pharisees. She's hearing. She has been rescued by God. She has been, I believe, born again. You must be born again. She's running to Jesus for deliverance. So, are you this morning hearing the news that Jesus died on the cross? He suffered in the place of sinners. He bore the wrath of God in the place of God-haters to make those very God-haters into God-lovers. Are you hearing this news? God the Father sent the Son to be the propitiation for sinners' sins so that in Christ, you might, in exchange for your sin, become the very righteousness of God, and He will change you from within, from an enemy of God, to a child of God. Are you hearing that news? Are you hearing this good news that God can make you clean, that you are a sinner and you desperately need Him to save you and to make you new? Are you hearing this news? Does it fill you with hope? You hear that, when you hear that news, you are a sinner, you've broken God's law, you need Christ desperately, you need deliverance, does that make you fly to Jesus? Or does it fill you with dread? When you hear the news of the gospel, does it fill you with hope? Or does it fill you with dread? Do you hear this good news and are you like this woman who flies to Jesus and says, only, only Jesus, only Jesus, I, I desperately need him? Or are you like the scribes and the Pharisees who sneer and forsake it and say, 
foolishness. If you are like the scribes and the Pharisees, you are perishing. But if you are like this woman and you hear of Jesus, a dying Savior, crucified for you in your place, risen up for your justification, if that is precious to you, it is because God has rescued you from the judgment and has given you a new heart. And from that new heart comes out faith and joy and delight and hope in Jesus Christ this is good news for those in this room that are wondering am I in Christ when you hear about your sin are you like this woman do you run to Jesus that's impossible for the natural man and the natural woman to do but if you are running to Jesus it's because he's done a supernatural miracle in you this woman has heard of Christ and she has hopeful hearing. So, does what you are hearing about Jesus fill you with hope? Then I would invite you this morning. Perhaps for the first time, you are hearing the news that Christ died for me. He died for me. I invite you, hear that word and respond. Come to the waters, whoever is thirsty. Drink from the fountain that never runs dry. Jesus, the living one, offers you mercy Life more abundant and boundless supply. Come to the well of unmerited favor. Stretch out your hand. Fill your cup to the brim. Jesus is such a compassionate Savior. Draw from the grace that flows freely from Him. Come, hear and believe. And as you come, recognize it is because God has made you new. I just urge you, please, this morning, trust Christ. If you are four years old, trust Christ. If you are ten, trust Christ. If you're a first grader, trust Christ. He will in no way cast you out. And if you come to Him, it is because Christ has purchased your salvation at the cross. So, Again, rejection comes out of the hearts that are unclean of the scribes and the Pharisees. Hope and desperation comes out of the heart of the woman made clean, the Gentile woman. You see the contrast. And that's the second characteristic of a heart made new. Not only do you hear, you have the capacity. Your total depravity has been conquered and now you no longer are totally unable you hear the good news of Christ and you run towards Christ. That's characteristic number one. But now there's also a deep desperation. I need Him. That's why I'm running towards Christ. I'm falling at His feet. There's a deep desperation and dependence on Jesus. Look at verse 26. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician, and she kept asking Him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Mark, make sure you understand that this woman is a Gentile. He doesn't mince words here, does he? This is one of those really hard sayings of Jesus. Mark, make sure that you know this is a Syrophoenician woman. She comes from Canaanite land. She's not of ethnic Israel. In fact, she's an enemy of Israel. She's not an ethnic Jew. And I think that's part of, that's the main reason this story is so striking. From the outside, this woman is anything but Israelite. But we see that within, she is actually more spiritually a true Israelite than almost all of Israel. She's like Ruth. Though she's not an ethnically a Jew, this woman before Jesus is a true spiritual Jew. This woman is part of true spiritual Israel because she kneels before Israel's king. What are all of Israel doing? Are they kneeling before the king Jesus? Israel in the gospel of Mark is represented by the scribes and the Pharisees. They are running away from Jesus. They are forsaking Jesus. And here, chapter 5 and chapter 7 are people outside of the camp, Gentiles kneeling before Israel's true king. 
Think about Romans chapter 2, 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So again, what a contrast Mark is holding up for you this morning. Here in this woman is a true Jew, circumcised in the heart, while most of Israel is acting like Gentiles. It's a great flip, it seems like. That's one reason, I think, for the ethnic background. I think that's one reason to provide you with a contrast. That's one reason. I think there's a second reason. A second reason I think that Mark gives you a very clear details about this woman. She's a Gentile. Why did he just, why did he just stop there? She's, she's a Gentile. He says he's a, she's a Gentile of the Syrophoenician ethnicity. I don't think that translation is good, that word race. Bad translation. And I like the NASB. Ethnicity. Why does he say she's a Syrophoenician? Well, doesn't that, does that remind you maybe of something in the Old Testament? Maybe? I just want you to think about what Mark has been doing so far. He begins, feeding of the 5,000. You look at that and you go, oh, that's bread, green pastures. Jesus is Yahweh of Psalm 23. It's an Old Testament illusion. What happens after that? Jesus goes and calms the storm. Oh, that's like Jesus is Yahweh who led his people out of Egypt. Jesus is the Yahweh of the Exodus. He's the Yahweh of Psalm 23. He's the Yahweh of the Exodus. What next? Well, Jesus declares all food clean, but only Yahweh can do that. Jesus is Yahweh. All these Old Testament allusions are happening, right? And then he says this thing about Syrophoenician women. Could that be an Old Testament illusion? I think it could be. Actually, I don't think it could be. It is. Think about Jesus. He's Yahweh. He's Yahweh. He's Yahweh. All these Old Testament illusions. Think about 1 Kings chapter 17. You could write that down. You could even go there if you want. We're not going to read from there, but if you want to just familiarize yourself, 1 Kings chapter 17. Do you know what happens in 1 Kings 17? Elijah comes to a woman who is a widow. What kind of woman is she? Do you remember? It says in 1 Kings 17, a Syrophoenician woman. She's in desperate need, and Elijah feeds her what? What does he feed her? Remember? She ain't got, any, she ain't got anything in the, she doesn't have any oil in the jar, so he... He blesses the jar. What happens? The jar fills up and they eat what together? Bread. What's Jesus just been feeding everybody else right here in Mark chapter 5 through 7? What has what he just fed everyone? Bread. That's interesting. He feeds her bread, but then in deep desperation, this woman in 1 Kings 17, she says to him, okay, well, my child has now died. I, I think I'm under judgment. Would you please heal him? Would you bring him back to life? She cries out. To Elijah, and what does Elijah do? Elijah cries out to God that God would raise up the child, and God does it. And the woman says to Elijah, truly, you are from God. You are who you say you are. And now here is Jesus, God in the flesh, who has not fed just one woman. No, he's fed 5,000 men plus women and children, bread with baskets overflowing. And now a Syrophoenician woman, same type of woman, same place. She comes in deep desperation, just like before, deep dependence, just like before, and she's asking, can you heal my child, just like before? The only difference is a son versus a daughter. And what does Jesus do? He does it. That's an Old Testament illusion. Who is Jesus? He's Yahweh of the Psalm 23. He's Yahweh of Exodus. He's Yahweh of the Pentateuch. You know who else Jesus is? He's greater than Elijah. He is God. Here is a woman who was in the eyes of the Pharisees ethnically, outwardly unclean, but inwardly cleansed by the grace of God. And here is Jesus the cleanser, the one greater than Elijah. He raises a little boy from the dead. God raises a little boy from the dead through Elijah. 
And now in Mark chapter 7, he has raised this woman from spiritual death so that she's able to place her faith in Christ. Jesus is God. He is greater than Elijah. And this woman in Mark chapter 7 is desperate for him. I want you to pay careful attention to the way Mark describes this woman. This is sweet. She kept asking Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. She kept asking. She kept asking. Now, if you were to go to Matthew chapter 15, that's Matthew's parallel account. You don't need to go there. I'll tell you about it. But write it down. In Matthew 15 is the parallel account of this same moment. And he gives a little bit more detail than Mark does. Matthew 15 gives us a clue as to what she was actually saying to Jesus as she keeps asking him. Matthew 15, the woman came out and began to cry out saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. That's what she says. When when Mark 7, verse Uh, Verse 26 says, she kept asking. Matthew 15 fills in the gaps. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Have mercy. Have mercy. You know what that sounds like? Sounds just like the tax collector we talked about last week. Remember the tax collector who went home justified in Luke 18? Right? He couldn't even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and he cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So to this woman. Be merciful, God. Please. I need your mercy. What does it mean to be clean? What does it mean to be clean? It means to be desperately dependent for Jesus and desperately dependent upon Jesus' mercy. She calls him Lord, the son of David. This woman knows who Jesus is. This woman knows Lord, son of David. And again, we have a contrast Mark 7, there are ethnic Israelites, the scribes and the Pharisees, who will not humble themselves and declare Jesus to be who he really is. They forsake Jesus. They forsake God. And Jesus is telling them, you're not clean. But in contrast, here is this woman who declares Jesus to be exactly who he is. You are the Lord. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of David, the Lord. She agrees with Mark 1.1. Jesus is who he says he is. She knows and she submits. She is kneeling at his feet while the Pharisees are sneering and walking away. She is desperate for him while the Pharisees are fools. She's clean while they are not. Matthew tells us more. In Matthew 15, in his parallel account, he, he writes, Christ's disciples, so, this, so this, this woman is crying out, have mercy, have mercy, please, I need your mercy. And his disciples, his disciples come up to him and implore Jesus, please send her away because she keeps shouting at us. <laughs> she keeps shouting. His disciples are even like, please do something. <laughs> please have mercy. I, I think it's funny. I think... Uh, best I can tell in Matthew 15 the disciples are saying she's crying out for mercy and now please have mercy on us because of her even the disciples are amazed and they're distressed by this woman's desperation and what does Jesus answer well Jesus answered in Matthew 15 I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel but the woman came and began to bow down before him saying Lord please help me she keeps asking do you see her great need and desperation for Jesus this is very much like Jacob in the Old Testament wrestling with God I will not let go unless you bless me that's how bad I need you where else am I going to go if not you you alone have the words of life if I don't have your mercy I don't have anything that's what it means to be clean beloved to be desperate for Jesus, to depend upon Him wholly. That's called faith. You want an illustration of what it means to have faith in Jesus? Here's one. Belief, resting, trusting, clinging to the Savior, clinging to the Deliverer, clinging 
to the cleanser. I cling to Christ. You know that hymn that we sing? I cling to Christ. That is faith. That is what is going on here in this woman. That's what it means to be clean. So are, again, are you this morning clean? I need you to check your heart. What comes out of it? Sometimes you wonder, do I have a clean heart? Well, what's coming out? Do you find yourself astoundingly dependent on Jesus Christ? When you think of your sin, perhaps you see some of the things that come out and you go, oh, Lord, why? Make me clean. Do you, do you find yourself amazed and desperate and dependent on Jesus? Is he your hope and your stay? Is that coming out right after sin? That can only come out if there's been a clean heart worked within. Are you desperate for Jesus? Where do you run to when sin is made known to you? What happens in your heart as you consider your sin and your need? Do you turn inwardly and try to fix it yourself like these scribes and Pharisees? Do you sneer at the idea that you, that you need a, a power outside of yourself to save you? And you can be like the Pharisees and they're fools because they have a foolish heart. Or, again, in desperation do you look to Jesus, confess your sins to Him who alone can cleanse you. If that's you, that's the reflex of a new heart. That's the reflex of this woman who is desperate for Jesus, whom Jesus is going to later on say, great is your faith. Great is the work that God has worked in you. It's very clear this morning. The heart made clean says with Spurgeon, oh, and this is a great quote. Spurgeon says it, not me. I have a great need for Christ and I have a great Christ for my need. I have a great need for Christ, and I have a great Christ for my need. And I will never, ever, ever outgrow my need for that Christ. You got that? That's the sermon summarized in one sentence, stolen from Spurgeon. Not stolen. Deep desperation, deep dependence, that is what it means, in part, to have a heart made new. And yet, how does Jesus respond to her? This is what's really striking. Verse 27 of Mark 7. And Jesus said to her, Let the children be satisfied first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Friends, you're not going to find that on a Hobby Lobby mug. I mean, did Jesus really say that? Did Jesus really call this woman a dog? Yes, he did. Now, some theologians, they point out that the Greek word for dog there has a slightly different ending than the typical use of the word dog. That's true. It does have a slightly different ending, and so it could, perhaps, it's a big perhaps, but it could be referring to a smaller dog, maybe a puppy, and they think that that kind of softens the blow. Maybe. You just can't get around the fact that Jesus is calling some people children and this woman a dog. Whether it's a puppy or not, okay? So don't try to soften the blow here when the text really doesn't allow you to soften the blow. Jesus labels this woman a dog. She's a dog while others are children. And it's very shocking to hear this language. Jesus is talking like this in a way that's it's shocking. It's supposed to be. The gospel is shocking to you. The fact that you need a Savior should be shocking at first. Throughout the Bible, each time the word dog is used, it's never used in a nice way. The whole Bible. The Old and New Testament often talk about how dogs lived outside of the town, right? Uh, as scavengers, they lived as animals on the outskirts of the city, outside the gates, typically. So in 2 Kings, when Jezebel is thrown down, remember, remember that in 2 Kings, evil Jezebel, she's thrown down and she dies as she hits the ground, and the dogs come up and lick her, lick her blood off the streets. She, they're outside. In Proverbs, the dog returns to its vomit. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, Beware of the dogs, the workers of evil. False teachers are dogs. Why are they dogs? Because they're outside the kingdom. The, the final chapter of the Bible, the end of the Bible in Revelation 22. How does the Bible end? 
outside are the dogs. This is the Bible. So to call this woman a dog or a puppy, it's deliberately offensive. It's deliberately offensive by Jesus. I had a friend in Morocco, not, more, of an, more of an acquaintance, and we tried to communicate to him. He was with a different missions organization, and he was so concerned about not being offensive. He would look at me and say, you're going out to Muslims in Morocco and telling them they need a Savior because they're sinners. That's offensive, Grant. Jesus would never be that offensive. And I go, man, have you read Mark 7? I mean, it's all over. Jesus is intentionally offensive. Why? Is this ethnic prejudice? Is this sinful partiality that Jesus is exhibiting here? Absolutely not. What is it then? Well, let me tell you what it is. It's Jesus explaining the kingdom. It's Jesus explaining the kingdom. And you know who's not going to be able to hear it? Those on the outside of the kingdom. Those on the outside. But those who are in the kingdom, they can hear it and accept it. Because they're members of the kingdom. That out and in language is very intentional. To be a member of the kingdom is to accept that you are a Romans 3.23 dog. You are a sinner, you are an offender, you have broken God's law, you have sinned against Him, and you don't deserve anything but damnation. And if that news is offensive to you, if the truth about your sin makes you stumble, then the cross is going to be foolish to you. What are you saying? I'm better than a lot of people. Well, then being called the dog is going to be very offensive to you. But, if the truth about your failures and shortcomings, if the truth about how you deserve the white-hot wrath of God, if, if the truth that you are but a dog, undeserving of any favor from God, if that humbles you, and it turns you to Christ, well, the cross becomes anything but foolish to you, does it not? The cross, a dying Savior, dying in your place, that news becomes the most precious thing in the world to you because yours is a heart made clean. That's what's going on here. Does this woman understand the depth of her need? Well, here's Jesus revealing that. Do you understand the depth of your need? You're a dog. Will Jesus, to this woman, be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense? Peter tells us, Jesus was a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to the Israelites, those who thought they were in. But to this woman, who they think is out, she's actually the one in because she is a member of the kingdom and she can hear it and accept it. And from that hearing, God bears a hundredfold. I hope you see all the things in Mark tying together there. Will she confess her sins all the more and be a recipient of of God's mercy. She's crying out, mercy, mercy, mercy. Here is Jesus revealing this woman's heart, and here is this woman's heart on full display. Here is a heart made clean. Clean. Here is a woman who was part of the kingdom of God. So think about that. The, the children at the table, they are actually the people of Israel in the illustration that Jesus sets up here. And the dogs, those outside of Israel, they are the Gentiles. And Jesus' ministry was, in fact, to the Jews first. That's very clear through the Gospels. He's going to the people of Israel first, and even into the book of Acts. The people of Israel first, then the Samaritans, and then the Gentiles. That's the order of things. Paul says the same thing in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the Gospel to the Jew first, then also to the Greek. It's all, that's all clear. What Jesus is saying is not wrong here. That is exactly right. Jesus is telling this woman, you aren't an ethnic Israelite. You don't get first dibs. You don't deserve first dibs. You're a dog, someone that's outside the camp. And what does this woman say in response? Verse 28. You're right. Yes, Lord. You're right. I am a dog. I am completely undeserving. But even dogs 
Even dogs get the scraps from time to time. Even the dogs under the table feed on that which the children are careless with. Even the dogs outside the city of Jerusalem feed on those things that the Israelites count as rubbish. Are you hearing that? I'm going to say that again. A whole bunch of people weren't looking at me. The dogs get the rubbish. What are the people of Israel counting as rubbish in chapter 7? Jesus. He's rubbish. I'll take him. So here is a woman who is a dog who understands better than the children. This story should be a gut punch more to the Pharisees than to anybody else. The dogs know better than the children know. How wretched then must the children be? How wretched their hearts must be if what comes out of them is more foolish than the foolishness of a dog. You get this? They will be cut off the olive branch for their unbelief, and those outside will be grafted in. Romans 11 tells us these things. Israel is continuing to reject Christ, reject the good news. But what are the dogs? What are the Gentiles? What are the sinners? What are the tax collectors doing throughout Mark? They're coming to Christ. Just think about the way Mark has laid itself out. The people of Israel continuing to reject, continuing to sneer at Christ, represented by the scribes and the Pharisees. They're rejecting. But throughout Mark, what are we seeing? What are the Gentiles? What are the tax collectors? What are the great sinners doing? Those that are supposed to be outside the kingdom, they're coming to the king. They are in. Do you know what it means to be in the kingdom? It's radically different than the self-righteous Pharisees think. If you think this morning that you can somehow earn your way, you can be clean enough on the outside to be a member of God's kingdom, stop your stupidity. You are foolish. God says so. Right now, this morning, humble yourself. Call yourself a dog that is guilty of Romans 3.23. You have fallen short of His glory. You've transgressed His law. But there is mercy in Jesus for a sinner like you. There is more mercy in Him than sin in you. So brothers and sisters, to be a member of the kingdom is to contritely confess that you are unworthy. To be a member of the kingdom is to agree with God that you are a lawbreaker, you deserve nothing but hell, and that only in Christ is there deliverance. That's the final characteristic of what it means to be clean, contrite, and confident confession. Yes, Lord, she says, verse 28, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. We're getting close to the end here. Just a few more things to say. Here is a woman who's heard of Jesus. She's believed on Jesus. She's ran to Christ. She's not going to go anywhere else but to Jesus for her need. Here is a woman who's been set free. Here is a woman who's been made clean. She hears the word of Jesus. She, 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 she hears about Jesus. She hears that she's a dog. And rather than respond in anger, rather than snap at Jesus and say, How dare you? How could you say such a thing to me? No, rather than that, she simply agrees with him. Yes, Lord, I agree with your assessment. I deserve nothing. But just think about what she's saying. But the storehouses of your mercy, God, are so great. The potency, I love this, the potency of your bread is so great that if it's just a single crumb were to fall, that would be enough. That would be enough for me. It would be better. A, a, a crumb, a scrap from your table, Jesus, would be better than anything else in the world. Well, that's the reality of a person being made new. Agreeing with God that Romans chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 2, that you're dead in your sins, you're a slave to your sin. You cannot do any spiritual good apart from God. That you're an enemy apart from the mercy of God. That's the reality of a person made you. You confess that you believe that to be true. You, can, you agree with God and that you desperately need Him. So do you identify with this woman unworthy? That you should be as the one cast out? 
Beloved, I just want you to know, if you identify with this woman, that you, and you've confessed your sins to God, I want you to hear this. You don't just get the crumbs. And this woman says, I'll just take the crumbs. But throughout the rest of the New Testament, it's very clear, you, you don't just get the crumbs when you confess your sins to God. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How's that possible? Well, First John tells us, through the blood of the Son. You don't just get the crumbs, you get the whole loaf. If you belong to Jesus, He has not just extended a few scraps. You have the very bread of life as your Savior. So, that's the conclusion of this passage. Jesus looks at this woman, she, and, and, he, and he tells her, Go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And Matthew tells us in Matthew 15, he says that Jesus also said, Great is your faith. So this woman has clearly been cleansed by God. This woman, she goes, she goes home, verse 30, and it's exactly as Jesus had said it would be. The demon had left. What had Jesus just, just done? He had kept his promise. Jesus had kept his promise. He keeps his promises. So I want to extend another promise that Jesus has extended to you. If you confess your sins, if you agree with God that you desperately need him, and you run to Jesus in hope, he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That is a promise of God, and Jesus keeps his promises so to be a Christian is at its essence to hear the gospel to receive the good news of Christ crucified for sinners like you he died for me you hear that and you hope and you run to him and you confess your sins to him you run to the cleanser in faith that's the gospel and he does not just give you crumbs he gives you himself so let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Leave behind legalism and self-righteousness. For here, in Mark 7 with the Pharisees, you do not have a lasting city, but you are seeking the city which is to come, which is Christ. And all God's people said, I hope you say amen. Come to Christ. He alone can make you clean. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, out of an abundance of words, let this truth remain, that you are a great God. You are full of kindness and mercy, and towards sinners who do not deserve it, you have given us the gift of salvation. From eternity past, Lord, you, you appointed realities, to heaven. you appointed elect to be saved, Christ secured and accomplished that salvation and by your grace and mercy the Holy Spirit has applied that to our lives you are merciful and we're so thankful so make us into a merciful people because we have been shown mercy in Christ let us be a people of mercy blessed are the merciful for theirs is the kingdom of God we thank you in Christ's name